Hi, everybody. I'm sorry you can't see my face live, but I'm excited to talk to you today about strip cropping. I'm going to introduce you to some research that I'm doing about three-dimensional diversity and how it can activate ecosystem service delivery in large-scale industrial-style arable cropping systems. My name is Lenora Ditzler. I'm a PhD student in the Farming Systems Ecology Group here at Wageningen University. And I work together with a, a great team um, in a network of crop diversity experiments around the Netherlands. And that's what I'm going to tell you about today. So let's start with some simple definitions. When we talk about monoculture, we're talking about a single field planted with a single crop, a single cultivar of that crop in one season and managed as one uniform unit. This is the standard way of doing arable agriculture in industrial, industrialized places. When we talk about strip cropping, uh, we're then talking about one field, but with multiple crops sown in multi-row strips. And these can all be planted within the same season. The idea is that the strips are wide enough, so they have enough rows of the, the same crop within it, that they can be independently managed with tractors. Um, but that they're also narrow enough so that there's actually ecological interaction happening between the different species planted in the field. Strip cropping could also be done with multiple cultivars, cultivars or multiple species mixed within the strip. Uh, and you can also do relay planting and strip cropping. And this is what strip cropping looks like on a real farm. This is the air farm near Elmira, and this is a 50 hectare strip cropping experiment that we work in in our research network. So why are we interested in strip cropping in the first place? Well, strip cropping is a form of crop diversification. And what we know so far from a lot of research is that diversity on farms works. In particular, it works to deliver ecosystem services. We've seen from this really nice recent study that just came out a few weeks ago, a, a synthesis of um, all the ways that crop diversification can promote different ecosystem services. And one of the really nice findings from this study was that not only does diversification practices bring uh, benefits to biodiversity, pollination, pest control, et cetera, um, but it also does not compromise yields. So this means that farmers get a win-win when they diversify. And strip cropping is interesting because it's an accessible way of diversifying. Um, farmers can do strip cropping with the machines that they already have. They can uh, work at kind of normal industrial scales, um, make the strips the, the minimum working width of the machines that they already have, and continue to manage their fields in a relatively similar way um, with the same tractors that they, they already have. So, it's accessible in the sense that um, it doesn't take tremendous reconfigurations to farm management, and it doesn't require that farmers invest in a lot of new machinery. Strip cropping is also interesting because uh, not only do we not have yield compromises, but we should also actually get a yield benefit. Um, this is results from a meta-analysis that reviewed different forms of intercropping, mixed, row, and strip intercropping, and compared land equivalent ratios in the three systems, and found that the greatest benefit um, to yield comes from strip cropping. So in strip cropping systems compared to sole crop reference monocultures, um, strips had a 25% higher yield than the, the regular monocultures. Despite this benefit, it's not really studied very much in Europe. Strip cropping has been and continues to be really popular in other parts of the world, in particular China, which I think you've heard about in this course. Um, but in the figure on the left, you see these are studies done on different intercropping patterns in different parts of the world. The blue is strip cropping, and there's very few studies done in Europe. So we thought that this was an interesting opportunity to fill a knowledge gap about how strip cropping could be utilized um, in the, the European context. And in particular, we are interested not only in the yield benefits, but also what other ecosystem services we could gain from strip cropping systems. So what we do is manage a, a large network of strip cropping experiments across the Netherlands. 
and it's a combination of experimental stations, um, on-farm experiments, and then farmers that we know and talk to who are just doing strip cropping commercially. And across these um, different locations, we're conducting research into a range of ecosystem services, um, and also looking at the mechanization opportunities and constraints, farmers' experiences, and different cultural services that are provided by strip cropping. I'd like to zoom in now to the Drubendal farm here in Wageningen, which is an experimental station on the university campus. And you're looking at the map of this farm now on the right side of the slide. Um, I thought it would be interesting to talk a little bit about the experimental setup and explain how the, the fields are designed because it affects the way that we do our statistical analysis. Um, and for some of you, I thought that might be interesting. And because of the scale that's needed to look at these spatial interactions in a strip crop uh, setup is so big, we have two parts to our experiment. On the bottom half below this pink road, you see that there's a complete randomized block design happening with three fields, three blocks, and three crop pairs. Um, and within each crop pair, three treatments, and every treatment and pair is present in every field in a random order. Um, we then want to, of course, compare this, the way the strips are performing to large scale monocultural references. But because the space that you need for those references is so big and it doesn't fit on the, the size of our farm, um, we move those references across the road to another field where we can have the large scale references. But this space constraint in terms of the farm size means that we can't have multiple scale references next to every strip block. So we have one reference for each of the main crops, but connected to that in the same field, we also have strips. So through these connected strips, we have a connected design, which allows us to statistically compare the performance of the strips in one field to the reference monocultures, which are in a different field. Before we dive into the results of some of our strip cropping experimental work, I want to first say a bit more about this concept of three-dimensional diversity. This will come back um, as we start talking about the results. This is a conceptual framework that we developed as a way to help understand what options farmers have to diversify their fields and then what uh, mechanisms those options activate in their in their farms and how they can affect ecosystem service delivery. So as a farmer with a simple rotation of one or two crops in your fields over the years, you have basically three options to diversify. The first is in time through temporal diversification, and this is practiced as a crop rotation. This is the most common way that farmers use diversity. Rotations are useful because they, they break cycles of diseases and pests and they help uh, farmers avoid exhausting their soil of nutrients, which could happen by planting the same thing over and over again. Another option to diversify is spatial diversity, which you can do in the field within the same season, for example, through strip cropping, where you make spatially explicit areas of two or more crops that are growing at the same time in the same field. And it doesn't necessarily have to be done in strips like this. You could also make pixels or hexagons or whatever. Um, but the idea is that you enhance the d interaction between species by creating more borders between them. And in doing so, hopefully you also enhance complementarity and facilitation between those species. Um, spatial diversification is also good for uh, host dilution and creating barrier effects that can enhance um, pest control and natural enemy abundance. The third dimension is genetic diversity, which you can do by sowing mixtures um, of either species or crops as if it were one, um, one crop. So mixing up two or three species and sowing them all together evenly throughout the field. And this basically creates spatial diversity, but on a plant plant level. And here you have similar effects of complementarity, facilitation, host dilution, um, barrier effects, et cetera, but on the plant level. So this whole framework of three-dimensional diversity comes into play in the example that I'm going to show you now. So let's get into some results. 
What I'm going to show you is results from two long-term strip cropping experiments in two locations, the Wageningen location and our Lelystad location, where we looked at disease control in potato and biocontrol potential in wheat strip cropped compared to uh, large-scale reference monocultures. For wheat, we used pitfall trapping to capture ground-dwelling arthropods, and we identified all the natural enemies of aphids in those catches. And for potato, we monitored late blight incidents and the rate of disease spread. And we did this in three different treatments, which I'll refer to in the next slides. The first is the reference, which is the large-scale monocultures of each wheat and potato. The second treatment was the regular strip treatment, where we put um, sole cropped strips of each wheat and potato, so a single variety and a single species in the strips, um, alternating with different crops. And then the strip mix treatment, in which we added the genetic diversity we mixed within the strip. Um, so for wheat, that was a combination of wheat and fava mixed together in strips. And for potatoes, a combination of three different potato cultivars one that was late blight susceptible and two that were late blight uh, resistant. Uh, for the potato example, we have seven years of data for the two locations. And for the wheat example, we studied it for three years. Basically, what we wanted to know was whether the stacking of diversity measures, so first the spatial diversity of the strip and then the added genetic diversity of the mixing within the strip, if this multiplied uh, diversity dimension would bring more ecosystem services. So we analyzed the results in two steps. First, we looked at the results of the spatial dimension, and then we looked at the results of adding the genetic dimension. What you're looking at here is the results of the disease monitoring in potato for the strip treatment compared to the large scale reference over all seven years of the experiment. On the x-axis, you have the cluster. So that's the year, the observation date, and the experiment block. Um, and on the y-axis, you have the median infestation score um, of the late blight disease. The blue is the strip, and the gray is the reference. And the main message here is that we see that the scores for disease incidence in the strips are almost always lower than they are in the reference within the same cluster. So that means at any moment, if you went out to a block and you counted the number of infected leaflets on a strip, uh, that it was statistically likely that you would have lower disease in the strip than in the corresponding reference monoculture. There was only one instance in one cluster where the strip had a higher disease incidence than in the reference. We then looked at the effect of adding genetic diversity within the spatial, spatially diverse arrangement of the strips by introducing the different varieties of potato into the strip. And we looked at the rate of disease spread um, over the season within the different treatment plots. What you see in the figure on the bottom, the large figure, is the days since first observed infection on the x-axis and the sum of the infected leaflets per, per meter squared in each of the treatment plots on the y-axis. And you can see a really clear trend moving from left to right. You have the, the large-scale monoculture reference plots in gray on the far left and the, the mixed strip plots on the far right. And the the rate of disease spread in these mixed strips is slower than in the reference and in the regular strips. And here um, we see evidence that there is added value to increasing the diversity within an already diverse spatial arrangement. Now we're looking at the results from the pitfall trapping where we assessed the, the abundance and diversity of ground drilling natural enemies of wheat. This is the total catch of the different natural enemy groups across the three years of the experiment. And uh, you see the reference in gray, the strip treatment in blue, and the, the strip mix treatment in orange. And the trend to observe here is that um, for all of the groups except one, the Pterostichus carabids, there were more um, natural enemies found in the strip and strip mix treatments than in the reference um, over the years. 
but that between the two strip treatments, there wasn't any significant difference to be seen. So the strips always had more than the reference, but the strip mix did not necessarily have more than the regular strip. We also looked at the diversity indexes for these um, pitfall catches, and we found a similar story um, that the the diversity was higher. There were a greater number of um, taxonomic groups and a, a greater evenness of those groups within the, the pitfall catches in both the strip and the strip mix treatments than in the references, but that there was no difference between um, the strip and the strip mix. So to summarize what we found in these two examples of strip cropping, for disease control in potato, we saw that the spatial diversity of the strip arrangement already had a positive impact on reducing disease incidence in the field. And we then saw that the addition of genetic diversity on top of spatial diversity through cultivar mixing within the strip added value to what we already had gained from the spatial diversity by then further reducing the spread of disease once it arrived in the strip. Um, but the findings were different for the abundance and diversity of arthropods in wheat. We saw that spatial diversity did increase the abundance and diversity of, of ground-dwelling natural enemies. However, that the addition of, of genetic diversity within the strip arrangement didn't add any extra value to the, the indexes that we were measuring. And this seems to be because um, the effects of the diversification dimensions seem to depend on the process scale and the range of movement of the organisms that we were monitoring. So disease spores uh, spreading by wind have different properties and dynamics than, than arthropods moving on the soil surface. And these results seem to imply that which dimensions of diversity a farmer implements um, should be chosen depending on which ecosystem services they desire to enhance. So in this case, if, if the farmer wanted to enhance biocontrol potential in wheat, the added complexity of genetic mixing within a strip wouldn't necessarily um, be required. In addition to the results that I just showed you, we've also been doing a lot of other small studies within seasons. Uh, we have a lot of master students working in our projects and, and in this strip cropping network. And I just want to show you a quick survey of some of their findings so far, um, which also support the, the idea that, that diversity can produce more ecosystem services. Um, we found in, in one study of the large scale strip cropping field that there were significantly more ground beetles in, in narrower strips than in wider strips. Um, another student found um, that there were less aphids in wheat in narrow strips compared to a, a large-scale monoculture throughout the season. Um, and Stella looked at the percent of, of damage to cabbages by pests um, compared to the amount of crop diversity within the field and found that there was a relationship where uh, the more crop diversity in the field, the less damage to the cabbages occurred. Not all of the evidence that we have from our strip cropping experiments is as clear as the, the results on the slide I just showed. And this is a good example. This is a study done by one of our master students, Rick, who looked at the abundance and diversity of arable birds on strip cropping fields compared to nearby monoculture references. And he did this on several farms in all different parts of the Netherlands. Um, throughout the summer last year. And what he found was that um, there's a really wide range in yeah, what birds he saw on which farms and how many they were and in which fields they preferred to be. The graph is a little bit complicated, but basically it's showing the different locations on the, the x-axis of the strip farms and the um, number of bird, arable bird territories um, per 100 hectare on the top and the species richness on the, the bottom figure. The strip cropping fields are the gray circles surrounded with a black line and the monoculture reference for the corresponding fields are the, um, the, black, the solid black bars that go through the middle. 
So if you see a circle above one of these bars, that means that the strip field had more birds or, or more um, species richness than the monoculture. And you see that they kind of are scattered all over the place. So what Rick concluded was that it, in the case of birds this season, it has had less to do with the spatial arrangement of the strip and more to do with the composition of crops in the field because the crops provide different kinds of, of habitat for different birds. And of course, I imagine that you would probably want to ask, what about yields? Um, do our experiments show the same yield benefit that that uh, meta-analysis I showed you earlier showed? And the answer is no, not always. Um, what you're looking at here is the relative yield of, the, of different crops in various um, diversity experiments compared to a monoculture. So if the the, the point or the bar is above the the one-to-one -one line in the middle, then the diversity experiment um, performed better than the monoculture. And you have different crops and different colors, and it, it's a little bit um, all over the map. There's some crops that seem to mostly do better in diverse systems, like the barley, and that's that's in pink. Um, and some that seem to not do so well in diverse systems, like the cabbage. Um, so this is ongoing research, and we're still trying to figure out what these relationships are between the diversity treatments and the yields. I also hope that you would want to ask about the crop combinations. Um, of course, when you have a strip cropping system, many things are next to each other, and the interfaces between plants is increased. Um, so not only is there potentially more complementarity and facilitation, but there's also potentially more competition um, between species. So we had a student look at um, all the years of our experimental data um, and compare the, the crop yields in monocultures to those the same the yields of the same crop when planted next to different things in the strip arrangement. Um, and it, it, it's a bit of a complicated graph with a lot of information, so maybe hit pause on your video and take some time to look through here. Um, but what we're, what we're looking at is basically evidence that there are many different interactions possible in the field and that some are beneficial and some show trends towards being less beneficial. Um, some crops seem to like being intercropped more than others. For example, you see that wheat always does worse when it's next to another species than when it's next to itself. Um, on the other hand, cabbage has more mixed responses, that it does really well next to some things um, and not as well next to others. In addition to all of this work that we've been doing to try to quantify the ecosystem services, coming out of the strip cropping experiments. We've also been working a lot with farmers and learning about their more qualitative experiences of what it's like to manage a strip farm compared to a monocultural farm. Um, and what, this is probably one of the most exciting results to come out of all of this work, that uh, the farmers tell us consistently that they really enjoy doing strip cropping. Um, this is a farmer named Cornelius Musselman and he's farming um, in the southwest of the Netherlands. And he's been documenting his transition of his farm from monoculture to strips in a series of vlogs, which I, I definitely recommend watching if you're a Dutch speaker. Um, he's been taking this process really seriously and dedicating himself to kind of self-reflecting on what it's been like to do this kind of farming. And it's really fun to see these farmers take on the challenge and uh, enjoy it. One, and we had a reflection meeting last week where a farmer said that strip cropping made him feel like a farmer again, as opposed to just a truck driver. And, and that was a really beautiful outcome of this whole project. As you've seen from all the information and results that I just showed you, there's many, many considerations that go into designing a strip cropping field from um, what your goals are in terms of what ecosystem services you wanna maximize to what your mechanization options are, um, what tools you have, how big you wanna make your strips, 
and of course which which crops you're going to grow in in which um, arrangements which neighbors which combinations are going to be the most beneficial how you're going to put that all into a rotation and then how you arrange that in your field so that you can actually effectively drive around and and manage your farm um, and this is all complicated stuff that requires attention so uh, one of the phd students in our group stella um, is developing a methodology to design strip cropping farms and there's a lot of pieces that go into this, including a lot of um, interviews with farmers and analyzing uh, companion crop databases to figure out what makes the best neighbors in strips. Um, she's also been developing a, a tool to help design strip crop rotations and then an application using GIS, which actually maps out the fields um, so that farmers can use shape files with GPS lines to guide their strap their tractors. So this is a really exciting integration of all the work that we're doing um, from the ecological to the mechanical to the um, kind of strategic and, and logistical aspects of strip cropping. So that was what I wanted to tell you about our work with strip cropping. And before I conclude, I want to just quickly dive into this other concept of pixel cropping, which is an even more diverse form of arable farming that's really on the cutting edge. Um, it's a totally new system. We've only been studying it for three years and there's so much to learn about this and investigate. Um, so I won't show you results here because we don't really have them yet, but I'd like to just sort of plant the seed, hopefully for some discussion later about this question of when does more diversity actually bring more benefit um, or does more diversity start to reduce your benefits in an arable system? Again, a definition, what is pixel cropping? So think of a strip cropping field, one field, several crops, maybe several cultivars, all in the same season, um, potentially planted in a relay. But rather than arranging the field in strips that can be driven up and down by the tractor, you cut the field again in the other direction to make squares or whatever shapes. Um, and the, you end up with these so-called pixels where you have a patchwork effect of different patches of crops arranged all around your field and each patch is managed as a separate unit. This is what we call pixel cropping. The big idea behind pixel cropping is that you maximize the amount of diversity in hopes that you also get maximum ecosystem service benefits. Um, but we don't know that that's true yet. So we have two experimental sites underway right now. Um, to where we're monitoring crop growth in different pixel arrangements to try to understand what the effect of is of this extreme diversity on different indicators, um, agronomic and ecological in the field. We have two pixel cropping trials at the Wageningen experiment that um, I already showed you with our strip cropping fields next door. And we have this new pixel cropping trial on a real farm here in the Netherlands um, where these farmers that you see have planted a one hectare pixel field composed of pixels that are one and a half by one and a half meters. And they've planted 30 different things in a um, carefully designed arrangement around the field. And one of the things that's really important, obviously, in pixel cropping is creating beneficial interactions and putting pixels next to each other that are going to be beneficial neighbors. So all of that work that we're doing in the strip cropping experiment try to try to understand how crops perform with different neighbors in strips is also helping us to then translate into a pixel setting um, and try to optimize the neighborhoods in the pixel field. And as a first step, we designed this field together with the farmer um, putting plants next to each other that he knew from his experience to be beneficial towards each other. We're still in the process of analyzing the data from our pixel cropping experiments. And like in the strip cropping um, fields, we've seen a lot of variation in how plants perform in the, in the pixel arrangements. Um, but one thing that was exciting this summer we saw was that on this, this large scale on-farm experiment, 
The farmer themselves told us that these were the biggest, most beautiful cabbages they'd ever grown in their lives. After 20 years of growing cabbages, something was happening in the pixels. So we currently have students who are studying the, the cabbages in, in these pixels to um, try to assess which plant neighborhoods resulted in the best cabbages and, and start to unravel what's happening in those interactions so that we can learn how to design really good pixel neighborhoods. Um, of course, part of the problem in designing good pixel farms is that there's just endless possibilities for the number of crops and, and the way you arrange them in this patchwork around the field and all the relay timing that's possible. Um, so we've been working together quite a bit with the CSA group, which you've heard from here in this course, um, to do some modeling studies of pixel cropped fields. And this allows us to simulate plant growth in a way um, and that's faster and more adaptable than actually setting up real in-field experiments. Um, and we have an interesting feedback loop happening now where we are doing in-field experiments and measuring plant traits in the real pixel crop um, plots and then taking those measurements into the, the plant simulation models and vice versa. Um, so we're learning things from the field that we can take into the models and then we play in the models um, to try out different arrangements and, and optimize different scenarios. And then we can take what we learned from the models to back to the field um, in the next iteration to help us design better experiments. The last piece that we're working on with the pixel cropping um, is the issue of technology. You can imagine that a farmer cannot use a regular tractor to manage a pixel cropped field because there's just so many small patches of different things. And in order to enable this practice to be upscaled or, or practical on any scale really, um, some form of mechanization or even automation is going to be necessary. So we've been running different workshops and collaborations with robot developers and the farm technologists and designers to try to start imagining what kinds of tools would be possible, um, what would be appropriate to make this kind of really complex farming system possible on a larger scale. And one big question we have is about the, the interaction between the technology and the ecology. So this is a farming system that's really meant to kind of mimic nature and maximize ecological interactions, but technology traditionally um, is meant to control ecological interactions um, and, you know, minimize variation and risk. So what we're looking at is how to alternatively design technology so that ecology is at the forefront rather than at the other way around. And that's kind of where we're going now with the pixel cropping research. So that concludes my strip and pixel cropping story for today. I would really like to thank the team that I work with on all of these experiments. Um, we talk about crop diversity and how important it is for sustainability. And I just want to put in a plug for human diversity as also being incredibly important for um, sustainability and for having a good learning experience. The work that you saw today is the result of many people's efforts over the years, um, many students, many researchers, all collaborating together with farmers around the Netherlands. Um, and it's a tremendous team that's really fun to work with. So I'd like to thank everyone who contributed to all the work that you saw today. If you want to learn more about our experiments, you can scan this QR code. It'll take you to our strip cropping network webpage where you can click on um, the projects that fund us and also find the pixel cropping information. And that's it for me. Thanks very much.